How do you get the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or any major publisher really to publish your article? Do you just email them and hope for the best? Well, you can, but according to Stephanie Lee, you shouldn't. Stephanie Lee is a media strategist for top online course creators. She also founded Clout Monster, where she teaches creators and online business owners how to take their business to the next level with traditional press and new media. And she has gotten her clients into publications like Entrepreneur and New York Times through cold pitching. She says the important thing for you to do is build clout markers to show you're trustworthy. And today, she'll walk us through how to do that using her slingshot method. Plus, we answer the question, will PR outreach make me rich? And in an extra long Build Something More, we chat about conferences, World of Warcraft, and Scranton? Like, from The Office? To get that version of the episode, it's ad-free, it is extended. You can sign up over at jointcreatorcrew.com for just 50 bucks a year. That's less than five bucks a month. You can get all of the show notes over at howibuilt.it slash 288. And thanks to this week's sponsors, Nexus and LearnDash. Now, let's get on to the intro and then the interview. Hey, everybody, and welcome to How I Built It, the podcast where you get free coaching calls from successful creators. Each week, you get actionable advice on how you can build a better content business to increase revenue and establish yourself as an authority. I'm your host, Joe Casabona. Now let's get to it. All right. I am here with Stephanie Lee. She is a media strategist and the founder of Clout Monster. We met at Craft and Commerce, and I'm really excited to talk to her today. Stephanie, how are you? I'm good, Joe. Happy to be here. Yes. This is our third time meeting since Craft and Commerce. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Uh, this is like, I mean, we'll talk about this and build something more, but this is my favorite thing about conferences, right? Especially there are some conferences you go to where it's almost like a family reunion. And then there are some conferences where it's like, I'm going to meet a whole bunch of new people and it's going to be great. Yeah. I think we talked about this before, but I haven't been to a conference in forever. It felt so rusty that first moment I stepped back into a huge crowd. And for a moment, I was like, oh, what do I do? Oh, yeah. Talk to people. (laughs) Yeah. I felt the same. And I'm like a huge extrovert, right? So I'm like, yeah, I'm ready. And then I got there and I'm like, how do I approach people? (laughs) And like, even like before, like I was like a pretty well-oiled machine for goal setting and I felt like a little bit rusty on that too. So yeah, so I'm really excited to talk to you about that and build something more. If you want to hear that conversation and every conversation without ads and more of them, you can become a member of the creator crew over at how I built at it slash 288 where all of the show notes will live. I suspect there will be a lot because we're going to have a great conversation. So Stephanie, I, well, let's just dive in here. I saw on your website that you have an you had an article in the New York Times. I would also like to write for the New York Times. How do I do that? Do I just like email them and be like, hey, I have a great idea? Or is there like a process in place for that? Wow. Well, that's a big question and we're really diving right into it, oh, right? Yeah. Diving so, right in. Yeah. So first of all, that was only one of my New York Times articles. And I kind of like to take apart your question a little bit. Yes, you can just reach out to the New York Times to say like, hey, I want to write an article about you. And you can read all these like pitching tactics. You know, if you Google like, how do I get published? How do I get published on the New York Times? There's probably gonna be a lot of pitching tactics. It's probably gonna be like, oh, you need a good story. Oh, you probably need to build a relationship with the editor. Like all of these like super tactical things. So Mm -hmm. I want to actually zoom back out and tell you a little bit about how I got into the New York Times. And, you know, this might be the unsexy and sort of expected answer, but it didn't happen overnight. (laughs) Right? (laughs) So, and it's not to say that you can't get into the New York Times. It's just going to take time. And a little strategy and something that most people don't talk about in PR, in press, and media in general. So when I said like, oh, there's a lot of tactics involved with media, most people ignore one of the most fundamental things about the media. And I think a lot of how the world operates in general. So 
Joe, let me ask you, like, what was like the last thing you bought? The Hover Bar Duo from 12 South. Okay. Is that like a sound system or something? It's uh, like a mounting system for my iPad. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So when you bought that thing, how did you go about deciding? Did you research it? Did you like hear from somebody? What was your thought process on deciding to buy that thing? Well, I had already bought from the company. The company's 12 South. I already bought from them. And so I got an email announcing the new, the generation two mm-hmm. of this thing that I had already bought and I bought it. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So you were familiar with the company. Yeah. You already knew that they had good stuff. Yes. Yeah. So similarly, I actually bought a new MacBook Air from Apple and I didn't even like bother looking at reviews or people's impressions because I've used this MacBook Pro, my older one, for like years. And I promise this tangent is going somewhere. So I've used this MacBook Pro for years. I knew Apple's reputation. I knew their products were great. So I was like, yeah, easy, easy purchasing decision. Easiest purchasing decision I've ever made in my life. I'm going to buy it. So this kind of ties us back to this idea of like, we both bought something because we were already familiar with that product. We were also really familiar with that brand because they have a lot of credibility. They have a reputation. They have a lot of positive reviews. And so we're looking as like consumers and just people in general, we have so many things to do that we're looking for these basically quick signals, these heuristics. I call them like just to be like, yes, I can trust this thing. I can buy this thing. So similar with media, that's how they operate. They want to know you have the credibility. They want to know that you're proven. They want to know that whatever decision they make to work with you or not is not the wrong decision because there are a lot of high stakes. So when you think about something like the New York Times, that's huge stakes for an editor to just decide working with someone on the internet. So They look to your credibility. They look to what you've done. So that's one of the things that helped me get into New York Times is because I've been writing on the internet for, you know, a long time. Like I wasn't published in the New York Times immediately, but I've been writing on the internet. I started on, (laughs) I started writing about video games strategy guides. That's probably something you did not know about me, Joe. (laughs) That was like way back in high school when I had way too much time on my hands. And, you know, the internet was very new as as far as blogging and getting published goes. Yep. One of my earlier blog posts was about, several were about World of Warcraft. So Nice. Yeah. I played a ton of World of Warcraft. Joe, we can, we can, we can yeah. totally nerd out about Con- that. Yeah, yeah. Let's, I'll make a note to talk about that too. In the <laughs> <episode. laughs> but there's like, that was the starting point. And then from there, I accumulated that experience to become an editor at IGN.com. And then from there, became an editor at Bodybuilding.com. And then leveraged that experience and credibility to write for Lifehacker and all these other publications. And so by the time I pitched New York Times and I understood the process, I understood pitching, stories, all that stuff. Like I had the credibility to approach New York Times to be like, hey, I want to write this story. And this is the stuff I've done. And then by the time they see that, they're like, okay, cool. She looks like, you know, she didn't just pop out of a rock and it looks like she does write stuff. So yeah, let's do this. So all of that to say, like, to get into, get published in the media, you have to like be strategic in what credibility you're showing, how to prove yourself in different ways. And I call this the slingshot method. So it's a very systematic way to build credibility and clout, basically. Gotcha. Yeah. So let's dig into that a little bit. First of all, quick sidebar, what color MacBook Air did you get? I got the Starlight. Ooh, you got Starlight. So I have the 2020 MacBook Air. So I think I'm going to wait for the next gen, but I want midnight so bad. Like, and I don't know if it's just going to look black or whatever, but that's the new color. So I need it. That was the color I definitely drooled over when I first saw it. But then I read the reviews and saw Marquez Brownlee. I think that's how you say his name. Yeah, MKBHD. Yeah. Yeah. His first impressions, he was like, oh man, it's such a fingerprint magnet. Like you touch it just Mm. slightly and you leave fingerprints on it. And I know, I know for a fact that would drive me crazy. Yeah. So I had to be like, all right, well, I just got to have a machine that does not drive me crazy, you know, on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. (laughs) I need to be sane. So that was why I did not get the midnight. Otherwise, I'm totally with you. Like you have to get that midnight. But it's just like a design flaw on Apple's part for that material. 
Yeah, yeah. The one of the iPhones a few years ago was the same way. And people were like, just put a case on it. And I'm like, I don't like cases. Like I just want, you know, I just want my phone. So yeah. Interesting. I'm glad you mentioned that. Again, I'm not getting one for a, a little bit, but unless they put out like a 12 inch one. Anyway, that's <laughs> neither here nor there. You started talking about the slingshot message uh, method. So yeah, because this was like, I think if you told somebody, well, yeah, so you have to write on the internet for 10 years and then pitch to the New York Times or whatever, 10, 15 years, whatever it was, that's probably, they're probably going to like turn pale and be like, well, I guess I'm never writing for the New York Times. But I suspect the slingshot method is an accelerant. Is that right? Right, yeah. right. You don't have to write for 10 years <laughs> <laughs> or even like a year. You can make this as fast or as slow as you want. So the, basically how the, the slingshot method works is that It was like three steps, basically. The first step is to find websites within your industry that's like within striking distance of where you are currently. And for most people, like you can just straight up write on your own blog, Medium, like those other sort of writing platforms. The point is that you just want to show you've been writing. That's your raw, unedited piece. And that you've been talking specifically about this thing, like in your industry, your niche, whatever topic that might be, right? So that's, you know, the first step is to just find those websites within striking distance. So let's say you've been writing on your blog and let's say you're a personal finance expert. So the first part, the first, you know, step that blog that makes sense is an industry blog, maybe Get Rich Slowly or Penny Hoarder or I Will Teach to Be Rich. Any of these sort of industry niche blogs that take guest posts That's your next move to get to those places. Because then when you get to those places, and especially if they're recognizable enough, then you move into a publication where that editor might be covering personal finance. And very likely that editor is going to recognize like, oh, this person was published on I Will Teach You To Be Rich. So that in itself is a marker of credibility. Like it's a clout marker, I call it. And so... That's basically telling them like, oh, okay, if this site trusted this person, you know, trusted you as a writer enough to get published on that blog, then maybe I can give this person a chance too. So it's kind of like when you're buying stuff, you know, you recognize the company and then you read reviews, see what people say. And so it's kind of the same effect here, like without actually, you know, you telling the editor themselves, you're showing, not telling. This episode is brought to you by LearnDash. Look, I've been making courses for a long time. I've taught at the college level and I've created curriculums for several different organizations, including Udemy, Sessions College, and LinkedIn Learning. When I create my own courses, there's no better option than LearnDash. LearnDash combines cutting edge e-learning tools with WordPress. They're trusted to power learning programs for major universities, small to mid-sized companies, startups, and creators worldwide. What makes LearnDash so great is it was created by and is run by people who deeply understand online learning and adds features that are truly helpful for independent course creators. I love the user experience. And now you can import Vimeo and YouTube playlists and have a course created automatically in seconds. I trust LearnDash to run my courses and membership, and you should too. Learn more at howibuilt.it slash LearnDash. This might be specific enough that they'll know who I'm talking about, but I don't think there's any ill will here. There was a coaching program that I thought maybe I was a good fit for. It was a five-figure coaching program, and I had just met this person. And I'm like, I'm not quite ready to give you five figures yet, right? I'm like, not I don't know you that well to do Mm -hmm. that. If you have like a thousand dollar product, right? Like maybe like two hours, just me and you or whatever. But it's kind of the same thing. Like it looked good, but I only had a surface understanding of the program. And it's the same way, right? Because I think there was a story recently, well, quote unquote recently, where I think an activist got on Fox News to talk about something and then it turned out that they, they were not at all who they said they were. Do you have, I wish I, a better podcaster would have the details ready, but I just thought of it right now. <laughs> a good podcast comes up with things on the fly. Hey, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so like you said, there's a, a lot of, there's a lot at stake and especially like the New York Times, for example, like 
their whole reputation is on good journalism, right? Mm -hmm. And so they want to make sure they understand that you know what you're talking about. And so you mentioned this clout marker. Let's say, okay, actually, perfect example, right? I'm writing a fortnightly piece for the podcasthost.com. Good industry blog, high ranking. A lot of their stuff shows up on the first page of Google. Do I write once for them? Do I need to write a couple of times for them? Should I write for a few industry blogs? Like how many clout markers do I need? Yeah, that's a good question. So you don't need to write more than once typically for the same blog. Unless you come at it from like a different perspective. So once you're published on one publication or blog, that's one clout marker of like, I've been published here. Here is my proven work. Here's my portfolio, basically, is what you're showing, right? That's one clout marker. Let's say you do write, you know, another piece for that same publication. And let's say that did really well. Let's say it got like 100,000, 150,000 views in like a day. That's another clout marker you can emphasize. So clout markers actually encompass this whole idea of like, what shows your credibility? And it's stuff like number of followers, number of downloads, credentials like PhD, DPT, like I'm thinking, I'm trying to think of other <laughs> credentials, but like basically to show you're an expert, right? That you know what you're doing and that you're proven in various ways. You can position yeah. it differently. So if you're an expert, credentials can be very important. The clients you've worked with, if, especially if they're recognizable names, that's a clout marker and could be important. The places, companies you're associated with. So if you were a Google engineer, that's a big clout marker. You know, an Apple product designer. Wow, that's right. a huge clout marker. Yeah. So it's like just all of these, again, like these signals and these heuristics. It's kind of like when you're on a website and you have social proof from like stories of people saying right. things. You've got the five-star reviews. You've got, in restaurants, for example, you have like the Zagat stickers, right. the TripAdvisor stickers. All of those are clout markers, basically, showing, not telling your credibility. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense, right? So you have one, two pieces on an industry blog. Then you have, again, like your clients, companies you work for, right? Mm -hmm. So like when mm -hmm. I was in the WordPress space, I always took a point to tell people like, oh yeah, I wrote the book on responsive design with WordPress. Like that, the only one that was ever printed and put on shelves. Nice. It was mine. That's and then I worked with Disney, like through an agency, but I worked on Disney websites, right? So that's like more clout building. And, and mm -hmm. so, I mean, I guess like it really comes down to like, you need to show that you know what you're talking about. And I guess that's the other thing, right? So... I'm in an industry blog. I've got clients. I want to write for the New York Times. If I'm talking about podcasting, but I have opinions about working from home or whatever, that's not going to be a good pitch probably, right? Because all of my clout is in podcasting. And while I do work from home, I don't have clout markers for that specific topic, right? Yeah. Like to kind of put it really reductionist and like simply, yeah, typically, yes, because then also that's a topic that's broad enough that their internal staff can cover. Mm. So the trick for you, if you did want to talk about that, because, you know, your line of work, your expertise does sort of flow into working from home, obviously. Yeah. If you had a very specific perspective on it, I think there's room for you to talk about that on the New York Times. Gotcha. So instead of saying like, how to work from home with kids, right? Pretty broad topic. We've seen all of the videos of like kids busting in on really important meetings. <laughs> but maybe my approach is how to record a podcast from home with kids. Yeah. Right? Actually, that's a great one. Yeah, that is. A, uh, I should write that down. I should write that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Especially because you do it full time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, right now it sounds like Things are on fire upstairs. I don't know if you can hear any of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, your, your soundproofing is really great. So Excellent. That's painstaking effort into making that happen. I was like, I've got two under two or two, two and under, I guess. But Have they bursted into your room while you were recording before? They haven't. Not in this house because there are stairs. And so usually the door has to open 
And then they have to make their way down the stairs. And usually my wife or the babysitter catches them. And I just <laughs> replace the doorknob and so it locks now. So yeah. <laughs> I have this recording light outside of my office. And when I hit record on these calls, the light automatically turns red. So mm. they know when daddy's recording, basically. So yeah. Well, I have a transcript of this now, so I'll remember the idea. <laughs> All right, cool. So we've done the slingshot method. We have a few clout markers from our industry blog. What's next? Yeah, so this is where the slingshot method continues. Once you find that industry blog, the next logical step, let's just kind of imagine this is the idealized world, right? So this is like a simplified version too of the slingshot method. So once you get into this, an industry blog, the next step is to just get into not necessarily the New York Times. That's like, you know, the big kids, like super big kids. Next step is to just get into another publication, maybe like Lifehacker, maybe something, another well-read publication that still deals with you know, the topic of we were using personal finance as an example. Another publication that talks about personal finance. So let's say that's Yahoo. Let's say that's Huffington Post. Something like that. So that's kind of where you start to think about, I'm going to go on to this publication first, knowing that New York Times is sort of like the big dog, right? You still want a few more clout markers before New York Times. And sometimes you can kind of skip through everything if you have a phenomenal story, mm -hmm. like phenomenal. And those are usually rare to be able to write about that and skip over all of these clout markers. Like you probably right. have to be like a, already a proven expert in your industry in some way. And then the New York Times reached out to you to write a story. But yeah, almost like a scoop worthy story, right? Yeah, like, scoop, yeah, okay. like a real scoop here. Something that's just so against the zeitgeist or on top of the zeitgeist sort of thing. But so from the industry blog, you go to the next publication, might be Lifehacker, might be Huffington Post. And from there, you're going to start to find, like, once you know how to get onto these publications, naturally your skill at identifying stories you want to write, talking to editors, like that starts to get better. So the side effect of the slingshot method is that you're getting in the practice and the reps of how to actually pitch well and like position your story well enough that these other publications really want to work with you. So not only are you getting the credibility in that published article and like all of these other clout markers, you're getting that practice. You're like basically kind of sharpening your ax before you go after New York Times. Not to say like you're an ax wielding murderer trying to like kill anyone in the New York <laughs> Times, but like, you know, I'm trying to use that Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> yeah, you, you want to cut down the tree without getting right, too tired, right? Right, right. Yeah. not go on a murderous rampage or anything. Right. And like, I mean, the other, <laughs> the other point here, right, is like when you're writing for the New York Times, you're shooting your shot. You don't want to put out crap. And like the editors can make it sound better. But like if you're not making your point, you might be making a bad first impression. So no one starts playing Major League Baseball in the Major Leagues, right? You got to start at single A. Exactly. That's a great analogy. And and what I see too often is people do want to go for the big leagues like right away. So maybe they do a Hail Mary pass like mm -hmm. from their blog all the way to the New York Times. And typically what happens is they'll try that one time, not necessarily having practiced the pitching and the stories and building that credibility. And they don't hear back. And that's super yeah. discouraging, obviously, right? Like never, no one responding to your pitch or responding to your emails is very disheartening. And then they give up and think like, this stuff doesn't work. I'll never get in there. So that's you gotta why- You got to know somebody. Yeah, right. I, there's just, you know, there's like an inner circle kind of thing. Yeah. And it's not true. It's just a matter of being more systematic and like following this slingshot method to basically work your way up to that point. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I hate to break it to people listening, but you're not the first person to think about pitching to the New York Times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Today, this hour, this second, like everybody wants to, or, or whatever, the New York Post. I don't know. I don't want to write for the New York Post, but Wall Street Journal, let's say, yeah. you know, a credible news outlet. Everybody wants to write for them because they know they have the eyeballs there. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we've got from a personal blog maybe to industry blog to maybe a publication just below the New York Times. So we've mm -hmm. got a couple of clout markers there. When are we ready to go to the big leagues? Yeah. 
this is the part where it gets a little fuzzy. Like mm-hmm. there's no clear green light that you're like, ah, yes, I've finally accumulated all the clout markers I, <laughs> I can possibly to start pitching the New York Times. And what I would say about that is you kind of don't know for sure. But what you start to look at is yourself as an expert in your industry, like how much have you written in your industry or how much have you already sort of practiced with your ideas? And then you move to like the the industry blog and then the first publication. Usually that's enough to start reaching out to the New York Times. I would not discourage anyone from trying to do so. And then from there, it's all about what your story is for the New York Times. Because you've already shown you can write about this stuff on other platforms. And so now it's about asking yourself, what's a part of the conversation in this general topic that I'm an expert in that I can contribute to that's basically hasn't been written about before that the New York Times would be interested in covering? Because, you know, at the end of the day, New York Times cares about impact. They care about the readers and the value they get. So those are the sorts of questions you start to think about once you've accumulated some of those clout markers to pitch New York Times. So I can't say for sure when you're going to be ready. You don't have to wait that long, I guess, Mm -hmm. is what the true answer is. Yeah, I guess it's less amount of time and more like you have a couple of clout markers and then you have your story. And this is really important, right? The New York Times isn't looking to publish tutorials. Mm-hmm. Like how to soundproof your office. That's not, that's like life hacker, right? Or whatever. That's not, that's not the New York Times. I would argue that there is some sections of New York Times. And this is like, uh, like a total, like zooming out. There's like a general tip yeah. for publications is that first you got to read the publication. And mm-hmm. lots of these <laughs> publications have various verticals, like various sections where they deal with very specific topics or types of articles. So how to's. And like guides to doing things is typically called service journalism. Uh And New York Times has a section for how-tos. So something like how to soundproof your room feels like it could be very relevant, especially in this age of working from home. It's certainly a very viable topic. So don't count yourself out there. That's really interesting. Service journalism. I hadn't considered that. I mean, I know they own like Wirecutter, right? And Wirecutter kind of covers a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. They're like more product reviews. Yeah, yeah. That sort of thing. What's the best foam to soundproof your office or whatever. But that's really interesting. So I guess let's let's maybe talk about more of the, I don't know, the traditional kind of media or the traditional kind of writing that like people associate with the New York Times maybe. Yeah. I say people, I'm saying me. But like you you do want to think about a story. Like you do want to think about a story, right? If they're thinking about impact... So so again, maybe for service journalism, I might say, hey, how to soundproof your office. If I want that impactful story, I would need to think of a different angle, right? Maybe like this part-time stay-at-home dad records a podcast with three kids at home. Like how does he do it or whatever, right? Like that's the story where I'm breaking the traditional gender roles or whatever by being a stay-at-home dad and running my own business and recording a podcast while taking care of my kids or whatever. Maybe that's, I guess this is a, a small aside, But how personal does our story need to be, I guess? I think the more personal you can be, the better. Because the idea of telling a story, especially to a big subset of the readers of the world, is you want to make it relatable. At our core, I think we're more similar than we are different. So your general story can start a little bit more broad and like like specific to your circumstances. But as you drill down into like the lessons, the things you're thinking about, the things you're doing, that tends to have more universal appeal. And that becomes more relatable to people. So the more personal you can get without, you know, getting into like super personal details. Right, right. right. I think that just makes for a more powerful story. It helps the reader really care about you and the story at hand. And it just helps them relate And at the end of the day, everyone reads a story because that's what they remember, first of all. And second, they feel it. It feels relatable to them in some way. 
at least for the reader reading that. Maybe it's not applicable to every reader, you know, your circumstances, whatever you're writing about, your specific story. But the right readers, you'll impact maybe their perspective. You'll teach them something or they'll just have, there's just some sort of payoff for them. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, right? I mean, and if if you think about it, right, that's the story, the interesting part of the story is the thing that sticks, right? And going back to the Fox News fooled example, right? I remembered that. I didn't remember that it was uh, an animal rights activist who was pretending to be the CEO of a pork company, right? <laughs> I might have looked those details up in the interim, but like I didn't remember all that. I remembered the big juicy part and then that mm. got me searching for the other part. Yeah. So that's really interesting. So with our remaining time, well, I don't want to move on prematurely, I guess, from the slingshot method, but We'll wrap up the slingshot method. And then I want to ask you, I think, two important questions here. One's going to be about the pitch. And then one is going to be about, will this make me rich? So (laughs) the pitch, will this make me rich? But first, are we missing anything from the slingshot method at this point? I think we covered like a wide breadth of it. And for kind of like specific examples, you know, kind of to read it if you want. And you can, I can just link to my blog posts in the show notes, and then people can take a look and read that. Yeah, that sounds good. And that was cloutmonster.com slash slingshot dash yes, method? Sling- okay. Yes. Cool. Again, I'll have that in the show notes over at howibuilt.it slash 288. It's probably also in your podcast player of choice right now. So you might not have to go anywhere to read the story. That's awesome. So now let's talk about Let's talk about the pitch first, right? Assuming Mm -hmm. we're all sold on wanting to pitch the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or whoever. What does the pitch look like? Yeah. So first of all, I have, you know, I have like a real pitch that people can take a look at in the bonus link for your listeners. But kind of the broad strokes of a pitch is you want, okay, so there's a lot of stuff going on in a pitch, but the basic elements of a pitch is, you know, the subject line is probably the 80-20 of the pitch because if an editor does not open your email, you're toast. <laughs> you're yeah. no, how, no matter how much work you put into the pitch, no matter how perfect it is, if they don't open, they're, you know, it's kind of pointless. So yeah, I would start with the subject line and it's, you can keep it really straightforward. Like let's just say, you know, story idea, colon. Actually don't use <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask, oh, should I just Don't like, use story idea. idea. Okay. Don't use story idea because inherently every pitch is a story idea. So mm. don't use story idea. But you want to grab the editor's attention with a subject line. And typically what works is just something like maybe a compliment, like, mm. hey, great article on X topic. Especially if that editor or that writer wrote about something in your industry. And that's why you read that article and that's why you're calling it out. Okay. So that's one thing to think about is just that subject line, like what's going to make them open? Like what's intriguing? What's clear to them? Like imagine they have so many emails in their inbox and that subject line needs to jump out at them. Yeah. I'm going to stop you right there. That's really interesting, right? Because again, I'd be inclined to be like, if I'm taking the soundproofing example again, right? How this work from home dad soundproofs his office to have a really good podcast, right? Like, but that sounds like a YouTube headline and they're probably getting pitched all the time. So they're like, why why do I care? Right. But the great article on X topic, right. Demonstrates that first of all, I read your work. I'm not just blindly pitching you. I know what you're about and I have opinions in, in this general area. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. They'll at least open your email because, you know, they can't help themselves. I want to know more about these, what nice things they're going to say about me. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously, <laughs> this is also what I have to stress. If you're going to compliment them in the subject line, you're going to have to genuinely compliment them in the email as well and show right. that you've read. Like, not just say, I read your article on blah and then switch to the pitch. It's spend a couple opening lines truly showing like that you've read specifics and you can do this by just like being like, yeah, I really agreed with your point about X. And I think Y is also a great solution. Like whatever you want, whatever flavor you want to add. And then you want to seamlessly tie it into the pitch. And in some instances, I even tell people to kind of start building rapport with the editor 
just send the compliment, no pitch. Because mm. this way, it doesn't feel like a Trojan horse, you know? Like right, you're not just right. complimenting only to yeah. switch to a pitch because I need something from you sort of thing. But um, yeah, I, I would say if you go the compliment route, which almost guarantees that they're going to open. And a lot of the time, if your compliment, your genuine compliment is well thought out, true, you know, like truly something that they know you read. And so a lot of the time they'll respond to you. This has happened a lot of times with uh, students and myself. So if you go the compliment route, be genuine. Don't go for a pitch right away. Let that breathe. And then later, then you can follow up with a pitch. I like that a lot. That's a really good approach, right? Because I mean, as I'm not the New York Times, but I get pitched a lot and I'll get like, I loved your, and then whatever the latest episode is, right? Or yeah, the second to the last pitch. episode. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, don't pick the latest one in the feed. Like, he'll know we're lying. We'll pick the second to last or the second latest one or whatever. <laughs> I usually ask, I mean, I have like a form now that I send people to, but I'm like, oh, what did you like about the episode? And they'll be like, I just love all the great advice that they gave. Oh, cool. <laughs> I have a transcript. Like, just pick right. a line from the transcript. Right. Yeah. Try a little harder at least to show yeah, that you exactly. listened or read. It's stuff like that. You know, those little touches that show you really are personalizing the pitch and that you give a crap, <laughs> basically. Yeah, exactly. Right. Because if you can't even, if you can't take the time to like 10 minutes to read an article or a half hour to listen to most of a podcast episode, what makes me or the New York Times think that you're going to put effort into your guest appearance or your yep. guest post? Exactly. And, and, you know, it's important for them to know that you've read it. You've done your homework because then, you know, that's kind of like a subtle cue to them. Like, okay, they understand our format. They understand mm -hmm. what's important to us. And they understand what's yeah. important to our readers slash listeners. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's so clutch, right? Because mm -hmm. again, it's like, I don't want the guy who writes the same article for a bunch of different publications. I don't want the guy who comes on my podcast and tells the same five stories, right? I want my listeners slash my readers to get something different. Mm -hmm. So we've built rapport. How do I ask? Do I just say like, I have a great idea? Yeah. So when you actually get into the pitch, there's a couple elements that I always emphasize that people need to like make really clear. So the first thing too, your pitch, keep it short. You don't need to write like this long meandering thing, like get to the point really fast. People are busy. So the elements you want to have in your pitch is what, Basically, what are you pitching? Like, what's the story? Like, make it quick, get to the point really quickly. Why are you pitching this? This is probably the most important part because editors need to understand why it needs to be written now. Like, why is this important? Is it because it's relevant to the greater conversation? Is it because it's going to impact a lot of readers or is it going to impact a small niche of readers? Like, make it very clear to them why this is important to write now. And the other component is who, like, who are you? Like, why are you the person that's suited to talk about this, to write about this? And this is kind of like where you start to flex your clout markers, right? Like credentials, your previous published articles, the reach you have. Because, you know, aside from New York Times, every publication and media and basically any platform, right, wants to know there's reach here. So we went over what, why, who, and then have a clear call to action for the editor. Like something like, I anticipate, if you're writing this article, for example, yeah. I anticipate this is going to be, you know, 1,500 words and I can turn it around in a week. Let me know if you'd like to move forward with this pitch. Keep kind of, keep it simple. Don't say, let me know. That's one of the weakest CTAs ever. It's just vague. I'm definitely not being put on blast here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very common CTA. Right. And I think it's just a misguided one. Yeah. And I mean, like I've seen effectiveness of like, is this something you'd like to move forward on? It just feels like a lot, like there's a question I need to answer now, as opposed to like, let me know. All right. Well, the ball's in my court now. Like I'll just, I'll either let you know or I won't. Right. You want to make the CTA direct the editor or the reader's attention, the recipient's attention to something specific. Like, obviously, back to the pitch, back to responding to the pitch. Yeah, awesome. 
Love that. So first of all, I'm going to update a few of my text expander snippets. <laughs> Full disclosure, text expander is a sponsor of this podcast. To uh, to change, let me know to something else. Usually it's like, let me know if you have any questions. Mm-hmm. But again, like I'd, happy, I'd be happy to address any questions. Is this something you'd like to move forward with? I think is is... Um, one that speaks to me pretty well, but it's something more than that. So funny. Right. I've never thought about that before. The way you want to think about it is like people are so, I want to say distracted and overwhelmed with a lot of messages. And so you want to give them like an out to respond if they don't need to. So that's one thing. Like you basically front load a lot of the thinking for them. Mm-hmm. And so that it's super easy to respond to right. whatever your request is. It's like basically a a yes or no. That makes sense, right? Because uh, the other thing, right, is like, let me know what the next steps are. All right, well, now I have to write out the next steps. Like, I'll do this later, right? They have to think about it. And yeah. they're like, uh, I'll do As this later. As opposed to like, I can have 1,500 words to you by seven days from now or whatever. Is this something you'd like me to do? Yeah, great. That also shows like, oh, okay, this is not your first rodeo. Like, you're experienced. You're a professional, you know? Yeah, awesome. Love it. Cool. That said, right, perfect pitch still might not be perfect timing, right? Like, you know, why is this important now? What you think is important now, the publication might not think is important now. Very true. Cool. Good to know. Good to know. This episode is brought to you by Store Builder from Nexus. When it comes to setting up an e-commerce site, you have a choice between easy but limited or a limitless platform that you need to manage yourself. Until now. Store Builder is e-commerce made easy for everybody. It saves you time and delivers a storefront that lets you get to selling. As someone who set up multiple e-commerce sites, I can tell you that Store Builder has been a much easier experience than anything else. Answer a few questions, add your content, and sell. Store Builder was created and is supported by e-commerce experts at Nexus. Get the speed, security, and support you need when you need it. Are you ready to launch your perfect online store? Head over to howibuilt.it slash storebuilder for a special offer. That's howibuilt.it slash storebuilder. Last question around pitches before we get to, is this going to make me rich? (laughs) (laughs) We both already know the answer to this question. So I think it's just funny. I keep bringing it up. I do want to elaborate on that actually a little bit. Awesome. Yes. Okay. So definitely stick around until the end listeners. Like this is like one of those like cliffhangers. You should definitely keep listening because I do want to ask first, you hear nothing. Do you follow up? How much do you follow up? When do you get annoying? (laughs) That is the perpetual fear I think everyone faces when kind of, especially like cold outreach and just Mm -hmm. general outreach in general is like, when do I start being that annoying person? Yeah. So a couple things about following up. Yes, absolutely follow up. I think the biggest mistake is that people don't follow up, especially after the first email. The second thing is wait a week to follow up. Don't like be breathing down their neck, right. <laughs> follow up in like a day. Because, you know, it goes back to people being really busy and people being distracted. They're not going to be able to get to you that quickly. So you want to give them a little grace period, like a week before your next follow-up. Right. I mean, if what if they're on vacation, right? Like now you just emailed them a bunch of times and now you kind of look like impatient and they were away from the office. And that definitely hurts, you know, your future potential chances if you come off that as that like impatient sort of like desperate vibes, you know? Yeah, right, right. Absolutely. So yes, follow up, wait a week. How many times? I would say max two because usually that next follow up or that first follow up is enough for an Mm -hmm. editor to make a decision about responding to you. I've seen cases, there have definitely been cases where you know, you have those two follow-ups and you don't hear back for a month. Like editors get back to you like a month or two later. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, don't be aggressive with the follow-up. Do two follow-ups max and move on. And move on. How do you feel about the magic email? Are you familiar with the magic email? No, I don't think I've, I'm familiar with that. It's like a single sentence that you send that apparently people swear works. It, and it's just this. Since I have not heard from you on this, I assume your priorities have changed. People Mm -hmm. say they use this and they swear they always get a response back almost immediately. 
I've used it once and it worked, but once is hardly a sample size. To me, it kind of like, I mean, if it's something I want from somebody, that still kind of feels like kind of passive aggressive or aggr- like aggressive aggressive, but I don't know. So, but I think max two is a good metric. Yeah. That uh, magic email, I think, works with clients, especially yeah. if you've had potential clients, you've had like that one on one FaceTime, you've had conversations, basically. Love that. With media, it's not the same because editors typically don't have that prior rapport with you. Maybe their priorities have been the same and they just were never on you, right? (laughs) Right. Their priorities are the same, but you're one of hundreds of people pitching them. So Mm -hmm. in the media's case, that magic email is just a little passive aggressive. And I guarantee editors would complain or find it distasteful. Yeah, for sure. That's kind of why I wanted to bring it up, right? Because I think people look at the magic email as like a hammer where everything's a nail or vice versa, <laughs> whatever. And, you know, it's, I think you put it perfectly. It's probably good for client, potential client work mm-hmm. and not good for, because you're trying to put yourself in the good graces of these editors to be like, hey, I'm not like a total schlep to work with or whatever. <laughs> right. right. Awesome. All right. Let's answer the big question now. They accepted my pitch. Huzzah. My article is published. Are the floodgates opening? Are hundreds of people joining my mailing list and signing up for my consulting services? Is this making me rich? (laughs) First of all, congratulations. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Second, okay. This This is one of the things I like to clarify with clients especially, that PR and press, a lot of people think that PR and press kind of automatically means more eyeballs, more exposure, like a skyrocket in traffic and conversions and just sales in general. A lot of the time that can happen, but it's not predictable or consistent. And so I actually call those side effects. Mm -hmm. The more important use of this press and this credibility is to basically use those logos on your website and all over your sales assets if you run a business, basically continuing to use those as clout monsters to op- or clout markers to open more doors and opportunities. So I always tell clients and students in general that the more press you get, that begets more press, more visibility, more opportunities. So that could lead to book deals, that could lead to speaking gigs, that could lead to a Netflix show, which basically like, all of these opportunities open up and the side effect of all of those opportunities mean just more attention on your business, more attention on your coaching, whatever it is that you have. And those are just the great side effects of press. And you just need to be able to leverage that press And basically what it comes down to is I never recommend media and press as like the primary marketing because as a primary marketing driver, like like I mentioned earlier, you can't predict whether it's going to one placement is going to get you that traffic and those sales. But with everything else that you're doing, like maybe Facebook ads, SEO, like all of this other marketing stuff, Press typically enhances those and amplifies those efforts. Gotcha. I like that. So you're, I mean, you're leveraging the credibility of the publication at this point, right? So Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. It's not that, it's not like getting in front of all of these, because the thing is, right, all of the eyeballs it's getting in front of are not qualified leads. Exactly. Everybody who reads my article is not a podcaster. Maybe they're just interested in like how a work from home dad is recording with three small children at home when it sounds like a war zone with their three children at home. <laughs> yeah. I really like that. So it's, it's basically like a bigger clout marker mm-hmm. for you to say to potential clients, like, yeah, I mean, I was in the New York Times. I know yeah. what I'm talking about. And in our industry, especially with coaching, info products, that sort of thing, where we are the face of that business, mm-hmm. credibility is so important, right? When you When people find you, There's so many people they could possibly listen to on the internet. So again, kind of similar to buying something. They're looking for these quick heuristics and signals to tell them like, okay, maybe this is the person that I trust about this thing. I like that. Well, Stephanie, this has been a great conversation. Had a lot of fun. Yeah, me too. I think we have a lot of actionable advice. I think maybe you'll agree with me if I say if someone wants to start today, 
the first thing you should do is write a niche relevant blog post on your own blog. Does that sound right? Right. Make the best freaking blog post you can. Make the best freaking blog post you can. Amazing. It's scientific. <laughs> Stephanie, if people want to learn more about you, where can they find you? Yeah, they can find me at cloutmonster.com. I write a weekly newsletter called TLDR newsletter and TLDR stands for something. I'm not just like too long, didn't read. Nice. And I have a bonus for you guys. I mentioned it earlier. If you want to see a real successful pitch that I had a client send to entrepreneur.com and it landed him an article there with zero connections. He didn't have any sort of, you know, he didn't know anybody. Basically a cold email. Like I share the full pitch and I break it down, like why that worked, why we wrote it that way. So you can check it out at clapmonster.com slash bonus dash pitch. Bonus dash pitch. Awesome. I will link to that and everything we talked about in the show notes over at howibuilt.it slash 288. You should also see those show notes in uh, your podcast app that you're listening to right now, probably. Stephanie, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Joe. It's great to talk to you and at length about this stuff. Likewise, absolute pleasure. And if you want to get an ad-free extended version of our conversation where we talk about our approach to conferences and maybe a little bit of World of Warcraft and maybe a little bit of Apple nerding out, you can, again, the link for the Creator Crew membership is going to be in your podcast player and at How I Built Diet slash 288. It's 50 bucks a year. That's less than five bucks a month, which is less than the price of an iced coffee here outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So I think it's a good buy. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. Thanks to our sponsors. And until next time, get out there and build something. 